This is another Feldenkrais lesson. Oh, yeah. I know you want to just relax and listen in your car. Um, yeah. This might not be the episode for that. I'd recommend instead popping down onto that floor. Oh, no. We got to do some work. Don't worry. It's easy. And, yeah. Enjoy it. This is the Feldenkrais lesson that I had with Jeffrey Schwinghammer and that you will now have with yourself. And another warning. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I messed up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my audio quality, my side of the audio, totally sucks. Jeffrey's is great, but mine, um, yeah, you can call it many bad names. Do whatever you want with it. You can scream at me. Um, it's not your phone. It's me. What happened was uh, uh, when I went down to the floor to, to do the lesson, I, I moved my computer, and in doing so, whoopsie, I uh, kind of uh, unplugged the cord and plugged it back in, and long story short, I switched to the inbuilt microphone inside my computer. So this is great. You get to see a sort of a sneak peek behind the stage raw dog experience into the computer, into all that stormy, crackling, uh, electronic, buzzing, 1995 modem kind of madness. Woo! Luckily, I'm not the main one talking in this episode. Jeffrey is, and um, it's not, not really a talking kind of thing. We're just like kind of listening in and listening to our body and letting it move. So let's get started. Let the lesson begin. So I'm thinking for this lesson, we'll do a little bit here in sitting. So for people who are listening, if you have some sort of chair that has a firm surface, a firm seat, that'd be preferable than like something like a sofa. Have something like a stool or a chair um, with a firm seat. And then the the main part of the lesson will be on the floor. So just have any sort of space where you're not encumbered by too much furniture around you. Uh, if you can do snow angels, right, that's enough space for this lesson. And then if you need anything like a book or towels to use as props, if you need some sort of physical support on the floor, definitely use that and incorporate that if you need it. Yeah, uh, the first thing we'll start with here in sitting. So go ahead and sit, both feet on the floor. And you don't, you don't have to sit in any particular way. You don't have to impress me or anything like that, right? You just, you just sit. You just notice your experience, right? So, so sitting is your two feet on the floor. So sense, sense if there's any sort of difference in the way your feet meet the floor in this moment. Right, we start we start these lessons with some sort of reference. A reference is how we are before the movements, before the exploration, and then we'll come back and check in again afterwards and see what changed. So right now we're not even trying to accomplish anything. We're just making some observations. So sense if uh, the distance of your feet from each other. Uh, does one toe or one big toe go further away, or like uh, is your step further away than the other toe? Since how your legs come up as supports into your knees, what angle is the back of your knees? Right? How far apart are the knees? And then move your attention into your pelvis. So. You can maybe move a little bit, shift forward, shift back. Where are you over your pelvis? Right? And, and we're just kind of pointing to the sensation. Do you feel like, like you're rolled back a little bit? Do you feel rolled forward a little bit? Are you more on one side of your pelvis compared to the other? Right? And so as we ask these questions, we can begin to notice these um, continual, or th these asymmetries we maintain. Yeah, I'm kind of more on my right side, but right. let's just keep going. I don't want to break the spell. Yeah, no worries. So like, well, that was, that was great. You noticed you're more on your right side, right? Cool. What, what do we do with it? Not quite sure yet, but we, we noticed that there's some asymmetry there. And I wonder if, uh, if you sense up through your spine, your ribs, your shoulders, if you're more on your right side and your pelvis, is there some connection to how your shoulders are? Does one shoulder feel 
closer to one side of the pelvis compared to the other. Since the distance from one ear to the shoulder compared to the other ear to the shoulder. Right? It's just, we're creating this sensorial map. We're just sensing into, okay, well, where am I in space? How am I in space right now? Yeah. All right. So we'll use this as a bit of a, a reference. So you can bookmark this, whatever you notice, that's good enough. And if you would, please come and lie on the floor. If you can lie long, uh, so your legs are long, your arms are long alongside you, uh, that's good. If it's possible to put your arms out to the side at all. Yeah, they're fully out to the side. Is it possible to put them up in a Y shape? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so welcome to the floor. Please lie long on the floor, your legs long, your arms long alongside you. And we'll just do a quick check in here. So sense the way your right heel touches the floor compared to your left heel. Is there some difference in the way the two heels meet the floor? Sense the pressure behind the right leg, the contact there compared to the left leg. Does one leg feel longer from the heel to the hip joint compared to the other one? Uh, Michael, you said uh, in sitting that you were kind of more on your right side of your pelvis. Yeah. And I'm curious if there's some echo here on the floor of like somehow their pelvis lies in a different way that's maybe reminiscent of how you were in sitting. Yeah, I noticed in my last Feldenkrais lesson as well that my right leg felt longer in the beginning and it, it does now too. Mm hmm. Yeah, so this is a way in which we maintain a shape. Like we're just checking in. There's some sense that the right leg feels longer. We sense it as longer. It's not bad. It's not, you know, it's not something we have to worry about. And that will definitely change through lessons. It's just, uh, I just want to highlight here, it's, it's when we check into our experience, oh, there are these differences. There's these ways I maintain a shape inside myself. Sense behind your low back, is there a space there? Yeah. You can even use your hand to check. See, like, oh, is there a space behind my low back or is there not? For me, there is. Yeah. Where, where does your spine connect again? Where is that? What, what in your sensation tells, oh, oh, yeah, that's where my vertebrae connect again. That's where my ribs meet the floor. Is there a difference, perhaps, between how the right shoulder rests on the floor? It's, it's contact compared to the left shoulder. Weirdly, the um, left shoulder is, has more contact, it seems. Yeah. So it's completely possible that you feel that way. And we use questions because individuals have their own individual experience. Someone might say, hey, my other side feels way into the floor or both feel pulled from the floor. So anyone who's listening, you will have your own personal experience, right? It's about being in the question and making these observations. Now, if you would please bend your knees and stand your feet. And did something happen to your low back? It raised higher. This, the, the gap got larger. Behind your low back? Yeah, let's, let's double check. Go ahead and lengthen your legs. You can even have your hands there. Bring your, you know, bend your knees, stand your feet again. And what, what happens? What happens to the part of your pelvis that touches the floor? Does the space in between your low back and the floor, does that increase or decrease? For me, the space increases. Okay. You feel it as increasing. Yeah. Yeah. If you put it, your hand there and lengthen your legs out, just to double check, if you lengthen your legs, 
how much space is there. And then if you bend your knees and stand your feet, right? There's, there's more if I stand my feet. Okay, cool. All right, you can take your arms out. And with your feet standing, your knees bent, please begin to make a movement of lifting your right foot. You, you unweight your right foot. That is, it, it begins to be less pressure on the floor. You return the foot and then make that movement several times. I lift my foot up. Yeah, so your knee comes more towards your chest. I mean, this could be a super small movement, right? So, I mean, the, the maximal movement is something like your knee coming to your chest, but it could be the smallest piece of this where your right foot lifts and sets a number of times. Yeah, just with the right foot. Lift and set, lift and set. And does your heel or your toes leave the floor first? When you set your foot down, does your heel or your toes meet the floor first? My heel meets it first and the toes lift off first. Okay. I think. <laughs> right. So we're we're asking for a a sort of thing that we might not notice in our experience, right? It's not, it's not always clear what's going on in our sensation when we begin to ask these questions. So take your time, slowly lift and set. And as you do this, what happens to your pelvis? What happens to the pressure behind your ribs, behind your back? Does your back come closer to the floor in some places? Does it lift in some places? The more I move my leg towards my chest, the entire thing meets the ground more more solidly. Like my pelvis meets the ground, my lower back meets the ground. Right. Then when I move it forward, then that gap kind of gets larger. Yeah, so there's this sort of principle here of if something goes up, something goes down. Yeah? So as you lift your foot, some part of you is going to go down. Yeah? Some part of you is going to meet the floor. All right. Go ahead and pause. Lengthen your legs. And we've just made a few movements here. And I'm curious now, as you lie with your legs long and your arms long alongside you, does this, has something changed in your experience? Perhaps it's the way you sense the length of your right leg from the heel to the hip joint. Or maybe it's the way the right leg meets the floor, the amount of surface area compared to the left leg. could be something in the way you breathe. Everything. Everything. Everything is made in the floor more. Or, no. Well, I guess I can't say everything, but the points I'm looking at are focusing on, like my lower back is meeting it more. My legs seem more even. And I don't know how much of this is just in this sort of imaginary map of my body or my actual physical body. Um, but it feels, I'm experiencing it as myself more in contact with the ground. Mm hmm Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a question we'll sort out over time in this work. You know, what is sensory map? How clearly does it match actual reality? Because, uh, I mean, in my one of my classes, you know, <laughs> I have uh, students that will very actively share their experience and you know one will go man my leg feels two feet longer or my leg feels 
like it's six inches into the floor, right? She'll she'll give these uh, descriptions of her sensorial experience. Now, her skeleton is probably not two feet longer, (laughs) but it speaks to how we sense ourselves. If you continually feel small, shrunk in on yourself, right? There's probably some skeletal component, but that sense of self affects your how you make decisions. So we, we get to play. Can we feel a little bit smaller? Can we feel longer? Can we feel heavier, lighter? All these things. We play with them. If you would, please bend your knees and stand your feet again. And is there a way that your right foot meets the floor in a different way now compared to your left foot or before? My right foot is more, more uh, meeting the floor. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's something in a way in which the right foot touches the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. I mean... I don't want to give anyone the experience of FOMO, like, because everyone's going to have their unique experience. But over time in these lessons, we'll, we'll find out our personal changes. So if you would please now lift your left foot, lift and set this foot. And it could be a big movement or a small movement. It can be a small movement or a big movement. The, the, the range of the movement is up to me. Yeah. It's up to you. And, you know, the encouragement is to move within comfort, to not strive for maximum. But what is the easy part of this movement? Because you can strive for maximum eventually. But here, when we're trying to learn and pay attention to differences, that sort of striving can get in the way, generally speaking. So yeah, if you go a little bit smaller, a little bit lighter, see how that might open you up to sensing more details. Right? The way your foot leaves the floor. Is it your heel first or your toes or the ball of your foot? And when you set down a similar question, what meets the floor first? What second? What third? And is it even a little bit different than the right side? For me, it's different. Yeah. Yeah, and I invite you to take this rhythm of do, lift your foot, undo, set your foot back down, do nothing. Then, once again, do, undo. Do nothing. To have that clear break of not acting. And the next time you lift your leg, is this something where you want to inhale or exhale? Or what what is the rhythm of your breath? Does it relate to the movement? Yeah. All right. Go ahead and, well, actually, since once again, what happens to your back as you lift your knee? Does one part of your back come closer to the floor? Go further away from the floor? Just find your own internal clarity of where, oh, there's more pressure here. Okay, here. And then it's here. And then it's here. Because you can even think of creating more pressure with that part of your back initially to begin the movement of lifting your knee, right? You can change your intention. Instead of lifting the leg the way you've done, you could think of pressing your back into the floor based on what you've learned, what you've sensed, to start the movement. Yeah. yeah. 
So we can do the same movement with a different intention, a different sort of image. All right, go ahead and lengthen your legs. Take a rest here on your back. Once again, please take a brief survey here <laughs> where you sense how you meet the floor, the way your right leg touches the floor, the pressure, the sense of surface area between the two legs, the length of your legs. Does one side of your pelvis meet the floor more clearly? Has it evened out in some way? Sense your ribs, your arms. Where do you make the most pressure with the floor? My calves. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, if you would, please bend your knees and stand your feet again. And put your arms up. Uh, they'll rest on the floor, but kind of in a Y shape, if possible. Yeah. And if your arms don't like being here, that's cool. Lower your arms to a height, or not height, but a, a placement on the floor that works for you. So you can bring them down closer to your sides if you have to. And we're going to play with a similar idea here. Please draw your right elbow to, to lift your arm, to, to lift your hand, to draw your elbow in front of your chest. Yeah. You can start with a small part of this movement just to taste it. Set it back down. You don't have to do the full movement. Right? You can begin to lift as, as if to go there. And as you lift your arm, since is this easy? Is it heavy? Is it a lot of work or or not? And I invite you to consider your hand, consider your forearm. Is there any sort of shape you're maintaining in your hand or arm as you lift? Is it possible for your elbow to be bent as it comes forward? That your hand can kind of hang towards your face? Yeah, that your the, the forearm of your arm can just kind of like hang, that the elbow doesn't have to be extended. And then your hand can kind of like rest on your face even if depending on how close it is. Right? And then bring the elbow back down to the floor. Have the arm come back out in a line and then bring the elbow up. So your elbow comes in front of your chest. Your hand can hang in front of your face. And how can this movement become more and more simple? That less and less effort in your forearm. Yeah, and have it so the palm comes and you can look into your palm as it rests in front of your face. Yeah. And as you do this movement, what presses into the floor? Once again, here's a limb lifting. What presses? What comes more in contact with the floor? Is this something where you want to hold your breath? Do you inhale as you lift, exhale, some, some, some variation? I keep forgetting about my breath until you, until you bring it up. And I realize, oh, I'm, I'm holding my breath a lot, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a very common experience. It happens for a lot of people. As we concentrate, we often can like hold our breath in the midst of thinking intently. This is also kind of like a, um, a an idea I had just now. It feels like you're kind of stopping time uh, in a way, and we're rewinding and fast-forwarding and pausing and really, really slowly rewinding. And it's like by watching the tape that you are, I guess it's your habits or something, that's what's going on here. Yeah, that's a beautiful metaphor. I, I love that. That's, that's a wonderful way to describe it. Yeah, go ahead and have your arms down alongside you, lengthen out your legs. Yeah, we we are stopping time, in a sense. Yeah. Feel free to have your arms and legs long and ch- check in with how this movement exploration has affected the sense of your arm, the sense of your shoulder and your ribs. And you can use your left side as a comparison for your right side. Yeah, we, these habits, these adaptations, these protections that we have, we're often unaware when we start the habit, right? And so in these, these explorations, we kind of slow down time. We open up that window for our perception so we can become aware of what happens so quickly. So quickly do we jump into habits so quickly. But if we can slow down time and ask these questions, we can actually catch these moments of the habits as they as they occur. And then we have the choice eventually, as we get better and better at this process, we can inhibit the habit, that invisible habit that we continue to play out until we can stop it with your arms out in this sort of Y shape or whatever works for you, and your knees bent and your feet standing, please draw your left arm in front of you. So the elbow comes forward over your chest, and you can have the forearm hang, right? You don't have to use any effort there, right? And so the hand can, can the palm can kind of face your face. <laughs> as the elbow comes more closer over your chest and returns to the floor. Now, in a lot of exercise, we can do this 10 times. We can do the reps, get her done. And here, it's a little bit of a different question. It's each repetition, each movement is another opportunity to observe the relationships. And well, okay, well, what presses into the floor? What happens to my ribs? Does my head feel this movement in some way? That like, Is there a little bit of a turn left or right? Can my pelvis even sense this movement? Is there some echo down into my feet? All right. Once again, how is your breath? Yeah, it's definitely more rhythmic than before. Um, sorry to interrupt the lesson, but um, it's also like amazing how yeah. I just realized how much I never touch my face, even just my forehead. It's like, wow, that's nice. Hey, buddy, there you are. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I love that. That's such a like a wonderful like. Uh, observation insight is like I you've just met yourself in a new way and you like it yeah, it's like your your puppy dog is like right? it was gone for 10 years you're like oh it just comes home and you're like oh hey forgot about you <laughs> <laughs> oh hey yeah 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 there's a sort of that that experience that just recedes and disappears or enters into our blind spot. And we don't realize that's a way of relating to ourselves. All right. So 
Take a moment and rest. You can have your legs long, your arms long alongside you. So nice how like it kind of stretches your rib cage, which I don't know if I would have noticed that before, or maybe it's just the position of my arms. I never, I never do this mm. position, but I can, just, I can just feel my rib cage is like expanding, and that's like wow, it feels nice. Not just physically, but it just feels good. Like it, it does have a sort of confident feel to it, which is something uh, it's hard to achieve normally. Hmm. Right, you're pointing to a physical experience generating a sensation inside yourself, an emotional state, a thinking state, right? Thinking, feeling, moving, sensing, they're all interrelated, these habits. And so why movement? Well, because movement can be a way we can generate these experiences. All right. If you would, please bend your knees, stand your feet. With both arms now, please draw both elbows in front of your chest so your hands can hang and you can see them in front of your face or perhaps they touch your face. And make this movement a number of times. You let your arms come back down, you pull them up. What presses into the floor? What goes down to help you lift your arms. As you do this, what happens to your eyes? Where do your eyes look? Your eyes kind of follow the pattern of your arms. As my arms move inward, my eyes move inward. Not necessarily looking at my hands, but getting more inward. And then as my arms open up, my eyes seem to open up. Yeah, there's a way in which this movement actually changes how you look, how your eyes move, what it draws your attention. Yeah. Yeah, and feel free to have your arms hang. Like they're just kind of like this dead weight. They're, your forearms hang. They're almost kind of limp in some sense as you bring your elbow in front of you. sort of reducing the effort needed in terms of the shape you maintain in your forearms and your hands. How light, how how can they hang as you bring your elbows in front of you? Does that change the experience of the movement? Because you could bring your arms up in a rigid sort of way. Right? You could think of holding the shape in your arms. You could try that. Bring your elbows up and your arms in a they they, they maintain whatever shape. Or you could have them be relaxed in a sense. They can they can hang. The same kind of thing like before, like before like the the one little puppy came came home, like, hey, hand on the face. Now it's like it's older older ones. It's these bones, it's these arm bones, what do you recall them? The forearm bones, like Mm -hmm. and wow. Yeah. That's me. It's almost it's it's not scary, but it's it's on the borderline. It's borderline scary because it's so real. Hmm. <laughs> but it's nice. Yeah. It's nice. It's, it's this real old dog. It's come. It's come home. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and lengthen your legs. Bring your arms down alongside your body. Take a rest here for a moment. Yeah, that sounds like a a meaningful change in your experience, a sort of insight in some sense. I was just looking at your it's experiencing these parts of your body uh or seeing them or thinking about them in a totally 
different way, a kind of wider way, because like, well, maybe forearm bone? Like, what? what is there to think about that normally? What is it? Yeah. It's like, you could feel like it's part of you as much as, like, I don't know, your feet, your hands, or your eyes are. It's like, this is forgotten, neglected thing, but it's it's equally you. But you're, whoa, I don't know why I neglect you. <laughs> Sorry, guy. <laughs> 100%. If you would, please, bend your knees, stand your feet. Part of the habits we have are the habits in which we use our attention. How do we use our attention? Do we treat ourselves with curiosity? Or do we forget ourselves? Or do we ignore ourselves? If you would please, Lift one foot from the floor as if to draw your knee to your chest. Sense what presses into the floor to make this happen. Do that a few times. And then try the other leg. What presses into the floor? How does your pelvis move? What happens with your ribs? And is there a way to bring both feet off the floor so that both knees come towards your chest? Yeah, and as you set your feet down, can your feet meet the floor in the same moment? Can they lift from the floor in the same moment? Because you might notice, oh, one lifts first. That's okay. It's just a little game we can play. Okay, I can lift with one foot first, uh, sit down one foot first. Okay, I can try both. And then, okay, what if I get both to lift? Yeah. Kind of playful. All right, and then next time, please lift your feet from the floor, draw your knees over your chest, and then also draw your elbows over your chest. And there's a sort of mirror shape, the way your knees are and the way your elbows are. Your knees and elbows kind of face each other, and then the feet go downwards, and then your hands go upwards towards your head. And if, if you would, please, please bring your elbows and knees together and apart a few times. Yeah, is this what presses into the floor to make this possible? And there's no no need for you to achieve the touching of your knee to your elbow. Absolutely no need at all. So whatever distance that moves in that direction towards each other is fine enough. Because what we're interested in is the relationship of these limbs coming together and what presses into the floor. Would it be easier to have your head stay on the floor or to lift your head? You can bring your hands interlaced together and bring them behind your head. So you can kind of cup the back of your head, draw your elbows forward, and you can lift like this a few times. Yeah. Do you inhale or exhale in this movement? Or is this something where you want to hold your breath? Try all three, right? Try inhaling as you lift. Try exhaling as you lift. Try holding your breath. All right. Come back and rest on the floor for a moment.
Once again, please sense into how your heels meet the floor. The pressure behind your legs. The length of your legs. The pressure behind your pelvis. How does air come into your torso? Does it fill into your abdomen, down down below your belly button? Does it fill into your ribs? Does it fill backwards into the floor? Sense how your shoulder blades meet the floor, the ribs there. And has something changed in the way you meet the floor compared to the beginning of the lesson? Through, the, through this work, we find out that we're far more malleable than we think. I invite you to slowly roll to your side. Eventually, take your time here. Eventually come to sit. And then eventually come to stand. And you don't have to adjust anything right now. Just come to stand. Sense how you are over your feet. What part of your feet meets the floor? Are you more towards your heels or towards your toes? What sort of support comes up through your legs into your pelvis? How does breath fill into your torso? I invite you to come and sit down gently in your chair. Gonna sit on the that firm seat. To sit in your whatever chair you have. Alright, so as you come to sit in your chair. Check in with how your feet touch the floor. How the support comes up into your lower leg, to your upper leg. What is the shape of the bend of the the legs? Just just coming to sit in this way. And we haven't sad in a particular way, just the way you you are in your self-image in this moment. And where are you over your pelvis? Do you feel rounded back? Do you feel rounded or rolled forward? Do you feel more on one side? I feel pretty, I feel pretty centered, pretty centered now. feel pretty centered. I feel pretty like vertical or not. I don't know if this is in vertical, I just feel in horizontal. I, I'm just like, I'm, yeah, centered. Right, right. Yeah, I invite you to, what if you roll your pelvis back a little bit, right? So in that movement lesson on the floor, we draw the the knees and the elbows together. Is there a way to, what pressed in the floor, uh, what, what part of your back pressed into the floor? Can you think of that part pressing backwards a little bit? as your pelvis rounds, right? And and you don't have to look at the camera anymore. You can just, what shape does that take to your whole body to, to round forward? What happens to your shoulders? What happens to your head? And then if you roll your pelvis forward, right, where can you find that you can come a little bit more vertical through yourself? A few times you could roll your pelvis backwards and look down towards your navel. 
and then roll your pelvis forward and look upwards into your eyelashes. And then come where, somewhere in the middle that you find works for you right now. All right. So in this lesson, instead of giving you shoulds, like you should sit this way, or you should sit with your feet this way, we do these movement explorations. You have a different sense of yourself internally and that results in a different way of sitting. Yeah? Yeah. You have a little bit more choice. Whatever habitual bias that was there has changed in some sense. Is that true? Yeah, and you don't feel guilty for um, sitting in a certain way. For example, now I'm naturally, my feet are on the ground. And I'm not saying all my feet should be on the ground. They just They kind of are on the ground. And I guess it could be up, but it just doesn't doesn't feel right anymore. And um, my arms are kind of more back, but I didn't even think about my arms before. It's just like before we were talking about swimming, when I thought you swim with your arms, I thought you sit with your legs. And actually, I realized I'm also sitting with my shoulders and my arms and stuff. So, yeah, but I'm not like, I feel like less judgmental about the whole thing. And like, I asked you that question before, like, how do you sit? And I was, I was trying to find the the right answer, the correct answer. And now I'm like, I can, I can feel the answer and I don't know if it's right or not right, but it, it's, it, you, you can't even talk about it in that way anymore. It's just, I'm sitting. I'm getting tingles because you nailed it. You absolutely nailed that experience because the shoulds are this external authoritative, you should be like this. And what you found in this experience is something that works for you, something that feels right to you. You are becoming more and more the author of your experience. Yeah? The the, the authority becomes more internalized. Do I need to check with other people for the answer? Or I can look into my experience and be like, well, no, I like this. I don't need to gauge it by some external metric. I, I like that my feet are this way. I like that I'm sitting in this way. It works for me. That's good enough. And then all that stuff, that same that same thing carries over into your other actions in life, your your social interactions and your the, the risks you take on and uh the way you the way you dress, the way you move, the way you the way you live. And it's like sometimes before you're trying to ask you're asking for approval and asking for uh, acceptance and saying, oh, is it okay? Uh, is this, uh, is this good? No, you're not. This is me. And you're, you're not, you know, the right answer, you know, the right way to live because you, you feel this is, this is how I live. That's the more powerful thing about all this. And, um, yeah, this, this is, um, it's, it's crazy. Cause I, I, you know, I did this the first time and I thought, I thought it's gonna be like, okay, only the first time you're going to feel this sort of, wow. But then, I even listened to a recording of that same one with Paul again, and I had a sort of similar kind of, whoa, and it's the exact same thing. And now I'm doing another one. It's like more upper body and something else, but still this, you keep unraveling new and new parts of reality in yourself. And you're like, oh, you so you think you're becoming free. You think, oh, I'm free now. Now I'm confident. Now I'm, now I'm good. Now I'm like, and then you're like, oh, there's more, there's more. Uh, <laughs> One hundred percent, absolutely. This makes it Feldenkrais even super more exciting because it's not a one lesson, two lesson thing. It's just a, a it's life. Yeah, it's 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 life. It's a way of practicing being with yourself. Uh, earlier, I, d- I described that um, the the class is structured in the in a way that all the students in the room who come from different backgrounds, different life experiences, different challenges, the use of questions allows each individual to have their own personal experience to make these discoveries in their own way. Yeah. And we can take that a step further. Every time you enter into a lesson, you're different than the last time you entered a lesson. You're always growing and changing and there's always more to learn, right? There's no definitive answer in terms of, you know, 
okay, what foot is more on the floor compared to the other? You know, like in the moment, it will always be different. So we're kind of tuning into reality in that sense. We're tuning into how we are and how we grow and how we expand over time. Yeah, that's connected to everything you've been. Say if I did one lesson one like a week a week ago, all kinds of things happened in my life. I took certain actions. I did certain things. Things happened to me or didn't happen to me or whatever. You had a life that happened in that one week, and then you come back to even the exact same lesson, and it's going to be a different. Mm-hmm. You're gonna. It's a different reality, so it's, it's going to be a different experience. And you're right. It's like, it's like, like I said, you're kind of pausing time, and you're kind of doing this slow motion replays and rewinds and fast forwards and and you're yeah. finding things. When you do that, you're kind of waking up to the reality that that is there. In that moment, and you're like, oh, and that's visceral, and that's that's like, that's what we want. We want to feel alive. That's all it is. And um, and of course, with that aliveness, you feel possibility, and you feel, oh, I can, I can do something. And that's why I started swimming afterwards because I was like, oh, I don't want, I want to, I want to do something. I, I, I was I'm ready for karate or something, but you know, yeah. <laughs> now again, I want to, I want to. I felt myself just punching right now. You're not like not in a violent way, but sort of like you know, oh hey little dancing moves yeah (laughs) yeah it opens up possibilities and and that's that's what keeps me coming back to this work that's what keeps me going into these explorations is that there's something i can discover yes and then also it opens up that creativity it opens up that vitality it opens up new possibilities right like who knows where swimming will take you now right or if you get into karate or something like that, that if you, that that goes back to that, our sense of self value in our bodies, right? As you able to move more in the way that you like, how does that change the hobbies that you do, or how you go about the hobbies? How does it change your podcasting? Um, anything really? Yeah, so it's your relationship not just with yourself, but with the world, and then with the other people. Because I think what's stopping me a lot of times is like this fear of other people mm-hmm. or um, I, don't, I don't know how to how to dance with that side of gravity these sort of other nervous systems and people and looking at me and like uh, I think we can all relate to that mm-hmm. and if you can start to get that confidence of like how am I supposed to be around other people and you're like I'm sitting I'm just sitting like oh I'm just mm-hmm. then this is more simplified and you can just stop being scared of people and, and start uh, socially engaging and, and actually connecting probably yeah, with your physical body that's tangible, that you can sense these relationships. When you're in that stressful situation or when you feel nervous or concerned about what other people think, as you develop your physical awareness, you can then go, oh, I do this thing every single time. Like I bring my shoulders forward. every Like, okay, noted, right? That becomes a question that you can observe and over time begin to interrupt or make a new choice and that's where the new choice comes in is through greater and greater awareness thanks so much jeffrey you i I had an amazing time this this whole morning it's almost like a kind of weird dreamy kind of thing because you're like oh this is like that's not even about podcasting we're gonna go but it's like this weird like dream you slip into and you're kind of having this conversation with this magical creature and you're whoa and then you wake up and it's recorded and you're like what the hell was that? Because we never, we don't want to really do this normal life where we just like have these deep conversations and these deep experiences, yeah. like it's Feldenkrais. And then, wow, that's kind of cool how we can have these deep connections with our body and deep connections with each other. Uh, and I, I don't know why I keep bring, bringing back this podcasting analogy, but uh, yeah, podcasting in a way, I, it, it is, uh, it is sort of a, a form of Feldenkrais, and, and, and at least for me, it is. Uh, but maybe so, maybe if I could, I could start slowing down and kind of slowing down time when I'm doing this and I just get straight in the moment and like just listen, then maybe the podcast will get better too. Um, and you've got a podcast. Can you tell us about your podcast and where did people can connect with you or whatever? It's like a classic cheesy question. We, I, 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 someone's like contemplate, should I just skip this part? Is it rude? But I also don't, every podcast ends this way. So I'm also feeling like, am I, do I, is this what you're supposed to do? But um, it also seems like, yeah, people might also be kind of curious. So I guess I'll just kind of follow the tradition and say, how can people connect with you? Tell us about your stuff. 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, my, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on this on your show. Yeah, I do have a podcast. It's called Expand Your Ability. So Expand Your Ability, you can find it, Spotify, iTunes, wherever. Um, there's also my website, expandyourability.com. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. And on your website, like all this stuff you're doing, like say when the documentary comes out, it'll be like there'll be some sort of way to find it through that and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's not a lot of information there right now, but uh, as time goes on, I'll fill out more information about the film, um, any sort of online programs I have going on. Um, Do you have any other kind of recommended sources like uh, books or other podcasts or uh, people? I, I'm kind of springing this on you, but is there any other kind of cool Feldenkrais resources out there that people might like? Yeah, so um, so I mentioned the book Awareness Through Movement earlier. So uh, like the first half of that book is really good. Uh, I would recommend seeking out uh, a practitioner or some sort of lessons like this one. Uh, instead of going through the lessons in the book, that's just my personal recommendation. It's a little bit easier to have someone guide you through the process. Um, but the first part is really good at like some of the bigger picture of philosophy, the bigger picture of philosophy that we've been talking about. But yeah, so there are people in your area, hopefully, well, I mean, please take a look for any local Feldenkrais practitioners, get direct experience or, or find teachers online that work with you. There's a uh, Feldenkrais.com, I think has like a, a practitioner search. Yeah, I, I really encourage people to try this experience however you can, because it is ex- experiential. And something I like to say is uh, to give this work a fair trial because it is so different, such a different paradigm, such a different way of relating to yourself. And there's like hundreds of lessons that you need like at least six to 10 lessons to kind of begin to grok what this work is about. Because there's such a wide range of movement possibilities. And each lesson can be very different from the next. And you're totally right about that book. The first half of that book is amazing. It's like, whoa. Yeah. It's kind of actually, um, it's kind of a same kind of thing going on with, uh, I guess, what will be the last episode that we did where we had the conversation. The, our first part of our conversation was was like the first part of the book. And then towards the end, we started. To, I started asking about how do you sit? How do you walk? And it gets a little more difficult to, to put this into language. And But you did actually pretty well, much, I'd say, better than Feldenkrais did in, in, in that second part of the book. That part of the book reads like a, a how to ride a bicycle like as a manual or something, or um, uh, how to put together the desk. It was like an instruction manual, and it was like very yeah. quite painful actually to read that part. But then if you actually do the exercise, uh, if you actually ride the bicycle or um, play the sport instead of like reading the instruction manual, uh, it's actually a pretty pleasant experience. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a lot easier to go with a recording or a live class for sure. Yeah, and there's Feldenkrais people like all over, like most countries, probably, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, most countries. So yeah, definitely look for a local practitioner that you can work with. And if not, um, there's definitely people that work online. All right, awesome. So let's all keep Feldenkraising. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great verb, Feldenkraising. Yeah. <laughs> to Feldenkrais. All right, my man. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.